All right, well, last week I had you start off with a, uh, with a fill in the blank. All right, so this week we're going to start off with lists, not a fill in the blank, with lists. So if you have something to write on, either a piece of paper uh, or a corner of the uh, news and schmooze or a note in your device, I want you to take a, just a, I'm going to give you just a few seconds, literally. I want you to write down the name of every nation in the world that you can think of that is suffering under unjust, corrupt leadership. Just write down, just that down a few of the nations that you think fit that category. And I know some of you are thinking, well, we could just write all of the nations. Just write all. Well, that's not helpful. Just think specifically for a minute. Write one or two or three nations that come to mind. All right, next, I want you to list some of the signs of corrupt leadership in our nation. In our nation. What are the things you see going on that are unjust, that reflect corruption, and that are not accomplishing what God would desire through good government? That is, the support and the protection of uh, the people that the governors are ruling. So you can write down a few ideas there. And then next, write down <clears throat> how you are personally experiencing these things, personal examples of suffering under corrupt leadership. How has that impacted you? Have you been to, co to court, for instance? I've been to court with uh, different people, not myself, but I've been in court with people and have watched what I would call an activist judge make a decision. And that is a judge who is not necessarily following the law, but is imposing his or her own view of what is just on the situation. So maybe it's something like that. Um, maybe you have experienced uh, police activity that you felt was unjust or unfair in some way. Uh, and, uh, you know, we could spend all day filling out that list for obvious reasons because of where we live. So... Next, ways people respond to the effects of corrupt leadership. In other words, just, just list some of the ways people respond. How do they respond? Typically, what? Anger is a big one, right? Frustration of some kind. If it goes on long enough, despair, giving up, retreating, just keeping your head down, trying to stay out of trouble. All different kinds of ways that we respond. And so, so the question is, is, as we think about the world around us, and we think about this on a national scale from nation to nation, and we think about it on the national scale of our own country, and we think about it in our lives, the question is, is what message do we have for both the victims and the perpetrators of that injustice? What message do we have? And so that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. Isaiah himself is speaking to people who are stuck in those very kinds of circumstances. Israel has been dispersed by Assyria. The northern tribes have already been dispersed by Assyria because its leadership rejected God and chose idols and through that uh, ruined the people rather than ruling them in justice and in mercy. Um, <clears throat> Judah was only marginally better than Israel at the time, the, the southern tribes. And Judah was walking down the same path. They saw some positive changes going on, uh, particularly under the reign of Hezekiah. We saw Ahaz, it was like, it was really bad. And Hezekiah, we see the spiritual temperature go up, warming to the Lord, but then, whew, it goes right down right after it. And so Judah is walking down that same route. Uh, and so uh, Hezekiah, who rules now, uh, is, is a positive change. But the root of idolatry, the root of failure, runs deep in the leadership of the nation of Judah. And it is already beginning to bear bad fruit. And Assyria is right on their doorstep, threatening destruction, even as they did to Israel, the northern tribes. 
And so Isaiah speaks into this morass. His message is to the perpetrators, those who, whose infidelity to God overflows in corrupt, abusive, greedy leadership. His message is also to the victims, to those whose freedom, property, and welfare are sacrificed for the well-being of the leaders. His message is for the faithful, for those who are seeking to walk in fellowship with God, but who are nonetheless suffering the negative consequences of ungodly leadership. And so what message does Isaiah have for both the perpetrators and the victims of corrupt human leadership? And what I want us to see through these next two chapters is that Isaiah says, no God's might, no God's might, his strength, his power, his ability. And the reason he says that is because the life we long for is impossible without him. And the life we long for is guaranteed by him. And that's basically the argument that Isaiah is going to make to, this, to these people, both to the perpetrators, to the unjust, and those who are suffering unjustly under their rule and their leadership. And so we do have some home links. I'm just going to flash them on the screen. They are available on the small slips of paper. If you didn't get one on your way in, they're available on the credenza in the back. Please help yourself. We encourage you to take one of these home over lunch, sit down, think it through, talk it through, and then uh, read ahead to the next passage of Scripture. And so what, does the mess what message does Isaiah have for both the perpetrators and victims of corrupt human leadership? What is our message? You, you get that? That's, that's the question, really. Not what is Isaiah's message, but what do we learn from Isaiah's message that we want to make a part of our message? Not only our message to other people around us, but the message that we're speaking to ourselves because we are living in that same world and we are suffering the negative consequences of ungodly, unjust leadership. And so what is that message? And the message comes through, it says to know God's might. And the first thing I want us to see comes out of chapter 32. Know God's might because the life we long for is impossible without God. It's impossible without God's might. And you get that? What, what do I mean by the life we long for? I'm talking about that we all want to live free from injustice and tyranny. We all want to be free to work hard and to reap the benefit of that labor unencumbered by unjust demands. We want to be free to be in relationship with one another apart from those who would deny us that relationship for corrupt and ungodly reasons for their own purposes. We want to live, we want to live not only in a nation that is, and we'll see this in, this in the second chapter, we want to live in a nation that is not only free from political corruption, we want to live in a world that is free from disease. That's the world we want. Isn't that the life you want? I don't know about you, but I'm getting older and there's stuff going on in my body I'm not happy about. And the life I want is, includes that. It includes that. And so the life that we want is impossible. The life that we long for is impossible without him, without God, without his might and his power. And so Isaiah begins in chapter 32, verses 1 through 8. He tells us that it's only possible with God's might, this life that we want is only possible with God's life, light, might rather, because only God's might provides the leadership for which we long. The leadership. You know, we, we go through election cycles here in our country, do we not? And we're going to be coming up on another one sooner than we think for the presidency of the United States. And we stress and we pray, hopefully, about who we are going to vote for whom we're going to vote, right? We want to make a wise choice. We want to make the best choice. But we all have to admit what? 
None of the candidates is what we want in a candidate. Isn't that true? Every one of the candidates has something in his or her life and something in his or her approach to leading and rulership and governance that we know to be contrary to God's will for a leader. And so we know this, and so Isaiah makes it very plain in chapter 33 where he says, Woe to you, O destroyer, while you were not destroyed, and he who was treacherous while others did not deal with you. <clears throat> when others did not deal treacherously with him. And then he, goes, he says, as soon as you had finished destroying, you will be destroyed. As soon as, you, you, you're, as soon as you cease to deal treacherously, others will deal treacherously. In other words, what? What goes around comes around. And he says, nobody held a gun to your head to force you to treat the people you led the way you treated them. And I just want you to know, says the prophet, that what goes around comes around. And no sooner are you going to be done doing what you're doing than somebody is going to do the very same thing to you. Some other government is going to come along. And he's probably here speaking of the Assyrians because the Assyrians are going to be done in by whom? The Babylonians. And the Babylonians were no righteous people either. And so he's saying that, that the corrupt leadership is eventually going to, to fail. But if we go back to chapter 32, if you would, if you'd be so kind as to follow me back there, to chapter 32, he tells the people that there will be a leadership team that they're going to love. Wouldn't that be great if you got a letter in the mail? You know, dear Dan, the next president, vice president, and Congress of the United States are all going to be handpicked by me righteous, just, godly men and women. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's exactly what he says to Judah. Listen, he says this. He says, behold, a king will reign, what? How? Righteously. And princes, princes will rule justly. A righteous king and just princes. It's going to be God's leadership team. And if you go back, we won't take the time to look there right now, but if you want to read a little bit more about this righteous king, you go to Isaiah chapter 11, beginning with verse 1, where we read about Jesse's branch, where this amazing picture of the Messiah is. And so God is saying to the people of Judah through the prophet Isaiah, God's Messiah, his king, is going to reign one day righteously. And then it says, and princes will rule justly. And I want to read just a little uh, something out of Luke. This is also mentioned in um, Matthew in a slightly different context, but the same idea is repeated. Uh, Yeshua says to his disciples, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, in what role? What is, it, what is his role in the kingdom? The king, right? This king. He says, just as... Father has granted me a kingdom. I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's the picture. It's the same idea. That's what Yeshua was talking about. He's thinking about what Isaiah promised. He's saying, hey, and you are going to be those princes. And so he says, God is going to handpick his leadership team. And then he goes on to describe their character. It says, uh, each will be like a refuge from the wind, a shelter from the storm. What's that? The shelter, a refuge, and a shelter from what? The storm of, of, of the fruit of that injustice in your life and in society. And he says, like the shade of a huge rock in a parched land. And if you've ever been in Israel at this time of year or during the summer and out in the desert, you know how important it is to be able to find a little piece of shade because the sun will literally kill you. And so he's talking about the, 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 the heat uh, and the oppression generated by unjust leadership. There will be a protection from that. Verse 3, then the eyes of those who see will not be blinded or turned away. And the ears of those who hear will listen. And again, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 11, and you read about this one who is going to judge not by what his ears hear or his eyes see, but with righteous judgment. 
that that's the same picture he's saying that that the unrighteous kind of judgment the inadequate judgment that you have seen exercised in society is going to be done away with by this team and he goes on and he says uh, the heart or the mind of the hasty uh, those who act rashly um, will discern knowledge and the tongue of stammerers will hasten to speak clearly and so so what he's saying is that the kind of a false, inadequate, corrupt judgment that we're used to hearing, and, and you read some of the conclusions that the court comes to, and you read about their arguments and their logic and how twisted it can be, he's saying all of that is going out the window, and you are going to have righteous judgment. And then he goes on and he says, now, now he just, he, he takes the foolish leaders on. He says, no longer will the fool be called noble or the rogue, that, or the scoundrel, or the deceiver would be another good translation, uh, be spoken of as generous. In other words, like we look at leaders and people have this idea that, oh, he's a good leader, he's a wise guy, oh, look at all the money he gives. And really, these are people who have been using and manipulating the people around them for their own ends and are giving back merely a pittance of what they have collected for themselves. And he's saying that's no longer going to be the case. And he goes on and he says, verse 6, For a fool speaks nonsense and his heart inclines towards wickedness or does wickedness to practice ungodliness and to speak error against the Lord to keep the hungry person unsatisfied. And so here's, here's the fruit of that kind of unjust judgment. To keep the hungry person unsatisfied, to withhold drink from the thirsty. As for the rogue, his weapons are evil. He devises wicked schemes to destroy the afflicted with slander, even though the needy one speaks what is right. And then he contrasts them. He closes this section with this short contrast. But the noble man devises noble plans and the noble and by noble plans he stands and so basically what he's saying here is that in contrast to the leadership that we've known that will no longer be functioning we are going to have noble leadership that is honorable leadership those who freely do what is right that's the idea here freely do what is right now I don't know about you but I, if I had to stand before anybody for judgment, if I needed somebody to figure out what was wrong and to come to a just and equitable decision about it, it would be Jesus. <laughs> it would be the Lord himself. And that's exactly the picture that Isaiah is painting for Judah. He's saying, no, God is going to provide a leadership team. It's his might that will provide the leaders that you need to bring about the world that you want to live in, the life that you want to live. And so he reminds us of, the, he tells us about the leaders, what they're going to be like, these new leaders. But he goes on and he says, not only that we want, not only, I'm sorry. Not only do we want to know God's might because the life we long for is impossible with, with God, right? So it's impossible. Why is it impossible without, with, without God? Because we need what? His leadership team, right? It's impossible until God provides it. And so there is no leader that we should look to and think, oh, he has the answers or oh, she has the answers, he goes on from there and he says, but not only because does God's might provide the leadership team that we need, it's because God's might and only God's might provides the life for which we, we long. And so he begins this next section, chapter 32, beginning with verse 9. And Isaiah warns of the consequences of man's might, if you will. I'm going to contrast the idea of man's might and God's might here. And so he says in verse 9 of chapter 32, Rise up, you women who are at ease, and hear my voice. Give ear to my word, you complacent daughters. Within a year and a few days you will be troubled, complacent daughters. 
for the vintage is ended and the fruit gathering will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent daughters. Strip, undress, and put sackcloth on your waist. And then he goes on and he describes the mourning process. The mourning process. And so he's speaking to the women who are either in leadership or probably related to the unjust leaders. And if you go back into Isaiah chapter uh, 3, you can read about chapter 3 beginning with verse 16. We won't take time to look there right now. But Isaiah takes on the women who are part of the leadership, this ungodly, unjust leadership structure. And they're benefiting from it. You got to get this picture. These are women who are related to, married to, helping the corrupt leaders who are basically taking advantage of the people they're leading. And the wives are benefiting from that. And they're comfortable, they're at ease. They don't, I don't mind a dictatorial government. Why? Because I'm living in a palace. I'm married to an oligarch. And so that's the idea. And so Isaiah calls these people, these women, and he says, no, you need, you need to, to mourn because the, the ease that you are experiencing is short-lived, is going to be short-lived. And he calls them to mourn. And so I think he picks on the women here not only because of their relationship to the men in leadership, but because the women are the main mourners in a society, in ancient Middle Eastern society. Even today, if you see video footage of a, uh, an Arab funeral, for instance, and there are people mourning, the mourners that you hear are who? Mostly the women. And so that's the idea here. So he's telling the women, those who would be responsible for the mourning, to mourn. And look at verse 14, and he, he gives an idea of why. He says, because the palace has been abandoned. The populated city forsaken, hill and watchtower have become caves forever. A delight for wild donkeys, a pasture for flocks. And so he's saying devastation is going to come. You are in ease and it is an illusion, a complete illusion. You think things are fine. You think the way things are going is great and that you're winning. And he says, no, you need to mourn because that sense of ease is temporary at best. And so he, he goes on from there. And then he, beginning with verse 15, he says this. He says, until a spirit is poured, about, poured out us, upon us from on high. And so, so the picture that he's drawing is the consequences of Israel's failed leadership. And so he says, because of the failed leadership, cities are going to be destroyed. Fields are going to be destroyed. You're not going to enjoy the blessings that God wants to pour out on you as a nation. And then he goes on and he says, but that's going to come to an end. And again, it says in verse 15, until a spirit is poured about upon us from on high. And so here's, here's a picture of God's might doing something. You get that? That things are going to stay the same. You're going to suffer the same kinds of consequences over a period of time, and it's indeterminate how long that time is. But what is going to stop it is what? Man figuring it out? Man finally electing the right leaders? Or the right leaders finally seizing power? No. It's when God does something in his might, and what he does is he sends a, his spirit, and there is a spiritual transformation that impacts not only the people, but the land itself. Look what it says. The wilderness becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field is considered a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness will abide in the fertile field. And so here's a picture of the benefits of justice and righteousness, because with it come all of the blessings that God had promised them. He says, and the work of righteousness will be peace. And remember, peace is not just a cessation of warfare. Peace is what? It's the abundance of all things good. And so that's the promise he's making. And he says, <clears throat> and the work of righteousness will be peace in the service of righteousness, quietness, and confidence 
forever. And then he finishes up and he says, then my people will live in a peaceful habitation and in secure dwellings and, listen, undisturbed resting places. That word undisturbed resting places is the same word that he uses for the women who are at ease. Theirs is an illusion. This ease is permanent. This is reality. This is what everybody is looking for. This is what you are longing for. This is what I am longing for. And he says, and it will hail when the forest comes down and the city will utterly be laid low. That is when God's judgment comes, with it is going to come the blessing of those who are faithful to him. How blessed will you be, I'm sorry, how blessed you will be, you who sow besides all waters who let out freely the ox and the donkey, and a picture of the life that is to be lived, a life of abundance, a life of freedom, a life of genuine prosperity, free from greed and avarice and things. And so he says to us, he says, know God's might because the life we long for is literally impossible apart from God doing something, apart from God doing something. And so, so how does this, how, what is the message for us, right? This, this is the message for both the perpetrators and the victims. And the victims. The, the message to the perpetrators is, hey, brother, sister, you are prospering now through the kind of life you are chosen to live. You're getting away with it. But you will not forever. Because the might of God will come into play and he will bring judgment down on you, whether it's in this life or it's in the life to come. And you need to listen to God's message. But to most of us, we don't often have the opportunity to speak to people in authority that way. Most of us are just walking through the world together and we're walking with people who see the same things going on and are struggling in the same way uh, we are struggling. And our message to them has got to be, yeah, we're arguing about who the best candidate is. I can't believe you voted for him. I can't believe you voted for her. Well, okay, there may be some justification in a worldly sense to have that argument. But as followers of the Messiah, our message somewhere in there needs to be, you're right, both candidates stink. We have no good choices. And you know what? My hope is not in any of them. My hope is in the might of God and the leadership team he has promised his people. That's where my hope is. And that's the message that we want to give to the people who are looking to the world and looking to the might of man to bring about the world that we all long for. This is what God wants us. This is the message he wants us to carry. He wants us to carry the message that The life we long for is impossible without God. And to remind others to look that way and to pique their interest so they'll wonder, well, what is that? Wait a minute. You think that that the environment will be saved? You think that justice will prevail? You think that men and women are going to be retreated with respect and honor and courtesy and chastity and all the other things? You mean to tell me that murder is not going to exist? Tell me about that world. How are you going to bring that world to pass? I'm not going to bring that world to pass. But I know the one who will. I know the king of that world. And he wants us to to preach that message, but he also wants to preach that message to ourselves. He wants us to remind ourselves that when we are facing injustice, because remember, he's also speaking to people who love God. He's speaking to people who would reject the way the leaders are leading, who are trying as best they can to walk in fellowship with God according to his rules. And we'll see that in the next chapter. We're not going to go there this morning, but we'll see that clearly. And so he's speaking to us as well, those who know the king and who are trying to walk in a way that honors him and pleases him and yet are still living in a corrupt and unjust world. And he says to us, remember, remember, know God's might because the life you long for is impossible 
apart from him. It's impossible apart from him. And to remember, he is our hope, and we will see that more clearly in the chapter to come. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you again for your word, and we thank you for these words of Isaiah. Challenging words, uh, Lord, uh, words spoken to power and authority. And uh, we thank you that you speak to the injustice of this world and that you've given a, us a clear picture of your solution that it won't be found by us and that it won't be found by any government, any style of government, any man or woman, but that it is found only in you. So Lord, help us to open our mouths in this world that is so desperate for this message, to speak to them, to remind them of the hopelessness of what we are trying to accomplish in this world apart from you and then to point them to the hope we have in all that you will do for us. Lord, we thank you for our king. We thank you for the rule and reign that is to come. We thank you for the hope that it gives us in Yeshua's name. Amen.